hang on to your seats because we're going to get started right now with news you can use. We're going to talk about primarily the housing market and what's actually going on versus what you're seeing out there in the marketplace. Uh, there's been a plunge in home sales. That's the, the, the headline, the number one headline. During the month of July, we lost 12.6% of the sales compared to June. And June, we lost 30% compared to May. So for that year, those, just those two months, year to date, we've lost 50% of our uh, headwind in terms of numbers of sales. Now, when you look at specific areas, the Northeast, 37% drop in sales. The West, 50%. Uh, the Midwest, 23%, and the South, 21%. So if you're in the South, you do a lot of business in the South, good for you. Hang in there. That is the place to, uh, to be doing business right now because sales are at least 80% of what they were. Uh, July 2022, sales numbers, 400,000 units sold. So lowest it's been since June or January of 2016. That was considered the, the, the bottom of the market in terms of where things got the worst they were, and then they started coming back up. They started coming back up in 14, but that's when it, it just stalled out. And then it, from there, it came back up in 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22. Um, anyway, that number is way down. Two months earlier, it had been close to 600,000 sales. So it's, and we're going to talk about this in a second, about what specifically is going on and the news that I don't think you're going to see out there from anybody else what's really going on. A typical market is considered good at the three to six month uh, inventory level. So in other words, if you've got three to six months worth of inventory or essentially three times that number uh, up to worst case, about six times that number, you're in about an average market. I think three months is, is probably the more realistic. And that's what we've seen in the last 10 years. So, you know, you would expect a number of something like three times 400, which would be about a million two. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, but the biggest problem that we've got out there is the new home sales. Uh, they're getting clobbered. They're getting killed. And, and these guys are taking it in the shorts on stock price and everything. There is currently an 11 month supply of new homes. That's an all time highest. These guys got caught, pan got caught with their pants down on this deal. They built a bunch of these houses and then because of the combination of inflation raising the cost and interest rates increasing, their buyers have disappeared. Uh, you want to you want to go to the quietest place you can find in your neighborhood, go to a, an open house in a new house neighborhood on a Saturday or Sunday. There's nobody there. Nobody is, is touring these new homes right now. And, and the biggest problem these builders have is they've completed the building and their all-in cost is higher than they can sell them for. So every house they sell is at a loss. And it looks like they got to take the loss so that they don't have a bigger loss down the road. So in other words, I showed you guys uh, from uh, in Central California, I showed you some signs on a, a neighborhood that I walk by when I'm here walking. And a year ago, these homes were selling for, I think it was the high 600s. And now, and they've gone through two or three transitions down. Now the home, same size, are selling for the low 300s, same size house, 50% drop uh, in price of those homes. So the, the new home guys are really taking it in the shorts. But the biggest problem that nobody's talking about, and let's just look at this one number here, 400,000 sales last month. So inventory has typically been running about 1.6 million homes. Now, these are homes that are listed on the MLS, right? So everybody thinks, you know, the, the realtors and the real estate rah-rah community, and that's the whole deal. But actually last year, something like 40% of all sales were off market. And this year it's up even more. So what that means is this number of 1.6 was probably more like 2.7, something like that. Today, this number is 2.2 million. And I think the off market could be as high potentially uh, as another million four for a total of 3.6, 3.6 million homes. Now, when I say off market, I mean, these are homes that we all buy out there where people have said, you know, I'm not interested, or we're, we're approaching them 
And up to now, they didn't know they were interested in selling. We send them a card or a letter, they answer a Facebook ad, or you find them in Craigslist, and all of a sudden they become sales. So there's a huge chunk of that non-listed type stuff out there. And I think the total is 3.6 million. When you do the math, 3.6 million divided by an average monthly sale of 400,000, you've now got a nine month supply. And I think these guys have all been caught with their pants down. And I don't think you're gonna see this on the national news until maybe a month from now or maybe a little bit longer. And it'll be like a big discovery all of a sudden. Oh, wow, we got more inventory. You know, you don't hear anybody out there talking about an inventory shortage today. It's not it, in a month's time. It went the other way, except maybe Zillow, who's got their head up their ass, or somebody like that. Pardon my French, but that's really what's going on. These guys are trying to fan their own flames to sell off their inventory that they overpaid for, so they don't take a loss on their balance sheet and their stock price holds up. It's pump and dump scheme. But even the raw raw real estate community, the National Association of Realtors, they're not on top of these numbers. But you take their own reports and you dig down into them, which is what we're doing. And this is what you're seeing out there. They, they're playing with the numbers. They're ignoring this off-market component of 1.4 million homes on the market out there. So we could have something close to a extremely high demand buyer's market. In other words, uh, the, the buyers are going to be in control of this deal. That is a perfect environment for all of you guys who are in the real estate investment community because you're going to have many, many, many more opportunities, more at bats to buy houses starting today, starting last month, than you've had probably in most of your cases, your whole careers. Now, I started when the market was, um, you know, basically there was a down market type thing. And so there was a lot of houses out there. Our bigger problem was not buying houses, it was selling them because you could buy houses ad nauseum and you had to come up with creative ways to sell stuff. Well, last few years, you haven't had to worry about selling stuff because houses were short, there wasn't enough. And literally, uh, even on this show, five, six months ago, I was talking about there is, at the end of the day, there is a national shortage of houses. It is disproportionately distributed. Uh, it is very area specific. It's becoming geopolitically motivated. Um, and, and there's a whole bunch of other factors. So in other words, there's excess inventory over here and there's a shortage of inventory over here and here it's about balance, uh, so on and so forth. But the bottom line is we're gonna enter a period of time when you're gonna be able to buy as many houses as you want and you're gonna be able to buy them with terms. You're gonna be able to get all kinds of unusual long-term deals out there and you're gonna have a harder time selling them. So we'll be talking about ways to sell creative ways to sell things coming up in the future. And I'm gonna talk about uh, some issues that I have seen in the market. In fact, let me just address one right now. We've got a competitor out there who is teaching these people something that Blair and I don't believe in. And it basically puts the, they're wholesaling subject to deals. You guys probably all know who I'm talking about. They put these things together on these subject to deals where they are promising big dollar chunks to the sellers of the houses. And those sellers in turn are getting paid all of their equity right up front. So let's say one of the deals I actually saw the other day is $150,000 subject to, uh, the seller gets 50,000, the wholesaler was trying to get 20,000 for the deal and the house was worth maybe 260, something like that. On the surface, if you had the 50 and the 20 to pay the seller and the 20 to pay the wholesaler, uh, and by the way, the wholesalers are moving into our space, which is this transactional engineering space with a bunch of uh, force. There, a lot of them have left the business, but the ones who stayed around are learning how to wholesale these deals, um, which is a good business. And that's something you guys should be looking at. But anyway, going back to this example, once you pay the seller that 50,000, that's all they had in the deal. There's no more money for them. And once you pay the wholesaler 20, they're out. So you as the buyer are out 70 cash and you've got a house in theory, it's got some equity, may have some cash flow, probably has both, hopefully. Um, but the seller is no longer motivated to cooperate with you. All the seller has to do is just inadvertently tell the bank, oh, I sold that house. Uh, I sold it to Ashley uh, last week. 
and you know she paid me for it and, and they're like uh, they can call that loan due and so they have no reason to cooperate with you if they have money still owed to them and you pay them when you get paid at the end like if you do a lease option or something like that you're safe because you guys are all rowing the same way in the same canoe but once you give the seller all their money right up front the crap is over. It's done. I mean, they don't have a dog in that fight anymore. And it's just as easy for them to pick up the phone, tell Bank of America, hey, I sold this. They're going to call that loan due. Because keep in mind, Bank of America's got a 3% loan out there. They get that cash back. They could turn around and reloan that money at 6%. So why would they do that? I saw this happen before. And this is why my mentor, Ron Legrand and Blair's, uh, we were both mentored by the same guy. I just did it 10 years earlier than him. Um, and he said, don't ever give the seller money on a subject to right up front, make them work for it. In other words, make them wait for it until you get paid, then they get paid and everybody's happy. Everybody's rolling the same way. Uh, this other national guys that's selling subject to deals, he has not put that cautionary thing in there and he's getting everybody to sign off on, you know, addendum saying you're aware this could happen, blah, blah, blah. But I can tell you that the fit will hit the shan and someone's going to stay after school for detention. And if you're buying those properties to, to do something with, like the lease option or to keep in your rental fleet or maybe even the flip, uh, flip, you're going to be okay because you're going to turn around and sell it for cash. And, you know, that probably won't be a problem. But if you plan to long term, keep something like that. Don't put big cash into the deal. As my mentor, Blair's mentor, Ron LeGrand told us, Listen, if you don't write big checks, you don't lose big checks. So just don't write big checks. Don't take on debt or liability and don't write big checks. It'll be okay. Uh, but people are not paying attention to that out there. And they're getting these sellers paid off, keeping them happy. It's a great way to buy. Um, it, it's almost like dirty pool because you can convince the seller this is all you're going to get from, in fact, this is more than you're going to get from a regular rehabber who wants to buy that property. And uh, I'll give it to you all today. We can be done with it. I'll even make up the missing payments you've got, you know, whatever you're behind. I'll give you some equity. You can go on with your life. That sounds great, you know, roses and lollipops. But, you know, two, three months down the road, they're like, they're trying to apply for a credit card at Best Buy. And they're like, you still got this debt on this house. Well, I'll just call a bank and tell them to take it back. No, you don't own the house anymore. But you can call the bank and you can get the buyer in trouble. And it was in this kind of period of time when I had the two that I had called due on me, called due. Um, and both those companies, Countrywide and Norwest Mortgage, are out of business now. Countrywide got in big trouble for writing these, uh, these horrible mortgages and, and doing this kind of stuff. And today, generally, lenders can't profit from their bad acts anymore. They could in the past. They can't do it now as a result of some of the changes due to Sarbanes-Oxley and things that happened as a result of the 2008 meltdown. But nonetheless, if you've got a, lot, a big check that you put out there, you're writing big checks for these deals, be careful. You could lose all of that money uh, in, a, in a heartbeat and or end up in some kind of litigation. So don't do that. Don't listen to some of these other guys that will tell you uh, that this is you know, a great thing to do. Uh, I would be very, very, very cautious. All right. That is news you can use for today.